Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this beautiful South Florida day. I'm here with my good friend, Brian Kui. He has so, so generously come this morning to talk to us about uh, ICD-10. How are you, Brian? Good. How are you? How are you doing? Doing good. Doing good. The last time, the last time that we had connected was the, what, the Fahima conference, right? It was. And then you, yeah, it was. Let me tell you, it was the last session of the three-day conference and you know for your audience members if you ever had an opportunity to see christine in person please do that do not do it you know you, yes we have the webinars yes we have you know the virtual sessions but it you know it take the opportunity to see her in person because when she presents her what was it what was that you presented um uh telehealth telehealth right telehealth the ins and outs of telehealth and and yeah. uh, one thing I definitely liked out of that session was not just the information, but the way you presented the information. You walked up and down. It really was like a show. So, right. you know, you really, for those you know, that are watching and or listening, um, you know, get an opportunity to watch a live. It really is wonderful. Well, I, I enjoy what we do. I enjoy sharing mm -hmm. information. I So for me, it's like um, going to hang out with my friends and talk yeah. about things that I'm really interested in. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, right. It was fun. It was really fun. Thanks. I appreciate that. No problem. So uh, thanks for coming to talk to about one of the things I am very passionate about, uh, ICD-10 guidelines. Oh, boy. Here we go. Uh, oh, before we get started, I have to announce it's it's National Peanut Brittle Day. Oh. Not, not a fan of peanut brittle. Ooh. Um, but for those of you that are, there's plenty of it out there. <laughs> Um, I didn't know that. What was yeah. the the last recording that the last um last video you did? What was what was that day? What was I heard Redhead Day or something? Oh, like it was that? Ginger Day. Yes, <laughs> National Ginger. Day. Ginger. <laughs> and I shared the story about my son uh -huh. who was born blonde, and then when you know the man part, you know, you get older and you become a man, yep. and the beard mm -hmm. came in, and the beard was bright, bright oh, red. Oh wow! Yes, so he's partial that. ginger. Anyway. Okay. Um, so I know that a lot of our friends are a lot of coders, a lot of colleagues, a lot of, of our partners in this arena, they struggle with the guidelines. And so I thought it would be nice just to have a, a, a non-invasive chat about the guidelines mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. what each section. So last time I had Kimberly Jolivet Williams on and we talked about section one, subsection A, the conventions, it wasn't a convention that we get to go to. There were no tchotchkes, and that made me <laughs> sad, but, you know, good information. Right. Um, and today I wanted to talk about general coding guidelines because, mm. you know, again, it's it's tough. It's one more thing we have to read. It's one more thing we have to go over, and it changes every year, and we see all these things. And And honestly, not everyone loves reading these guidelines as much as we do, Brian. Right. I like the, the um, I, cause you gave me homework a little bit. Right. So I had to watch yeah. the last video. And the one thing I did like was, was how <laughs> you use the, the guidelines to put somebody to sleep. Uh, oh, yes, my <laughs> grandson. Yes. <laughs> it works every and, time. It, not going to lie. Was, you know, I mean, it's, it's just an idea for me, but what if somebody just read the guidelines to put somebody to sleep, you know, I, I just, just, just do it. And I think if you listen to it, either through osmosis, you might get it through sleep subconsciously and you wake up like, Oh, I, I know the guidelines. And if I think I heard three times, you have to listen to it. So if you run it yes. through three times, I don't know how long, you know, those guidelines would be for a couple hours, but if you do it three times, you might, you might get it. I don't know. You have to find the right system that reads to you. I have yeah. I have something on my phone that reads PDFs, but it's mm -hmm. such a computerized voice Is that it? can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. I think that well, we should have celebrities read them to us. Yes. Especially those yeah. celebrities that we really like, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that might make a big difference. I, I know if uh, Jason Momoa would read the guidelines yeah. to me, yeah, I would listen right? to them more than three times. <laughs> One thing that, there, <laughs> yeah, one thing that I, I've got into with podcasts, I mean, aside from recording them, is um, listening uh, to them to put me to a, to sleep. And yeah, no, for real, there's a couple of really? them. If you ever type the sleep genre, there's a couple of them. And there's one that I remember, I forgot what his name's, but 
but um, I think it's Sleep With Me podcast. That I had really? a and it's this guy who speaks in a monotone. He speaks very, he, he speaks in a way that doesn't make sense. And so you're so like lost in it. And then you just zonk <sighs> out. So I've listened to it a couple times. And within it like maybe, yeah, within 10 minutes, it's a habit now. I, I zonk out. So I figured, wow. let, me, let me, if this was done with, with, with the coding guidelines or any, you know, kind of coding guidelines, you know, zonk you out to sleep for real, but you come out so next, aware about medical coding. <laughs> the, the next Medicare proposal that comes out. Yeah. Like, final rule, yeah. right? Yeah. We're all like, for real. <laughs> But it has to be very soothing, not informative. Right. You gotta right. the purpose is to put the person to sleep. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> right. So let's talk about some of those points there, yes. or some of the things that we were kind of chatting about offline. Um, mm -hmm. some areas there that are really so when I talk about the general coding guidelines, I kind of say these guidelines pertain to every code in the book, but if they wrote those guidelines underneath every code or sign them underneath every code, oh boy. we're going to need a forklift to take our yeah. book from yeah. you know, one yeah. end to the other. Not just, that's just too much. So yeah. uh -huh. um, I like the fact that they put them off to the separate, to the side and they said, okay, so this area applies to all of the codes. So whatever mm. it is that we tell you here, it goes towards everything. So, mm. For instance, when they say that um, we don't we don't code signs and symptoms that oh, yeah. are an integral component of a condition. So if you mm -hmm. have bronchitis, well, the last time I had it, it had runny nose oh. and cough and I felt horrible and mm -hmm. all of those usual things that we experience with bronchitis, I'm not going to code those Correct. because bron we know bronchitis, that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, there's certain things there that remind us of how we should select those codes. Mm -hmm. I think also one thing to consider with the um, sign and symptoms, which are the R codes, correct? So mm -hmm. <laughs> I've seen them, I've worked with mm -hmm. them, I've audited them. Um, you know, when you think about the R codes, the symptom codes, you mentioned bronchitis, mm -hmm. uh, shortness of breath, cough, fever. Um, for a new coder, I've seen, especially students, uh, when I used to teach for you know associates program, I give that you give them the assignment mm -hmm. and then yeah. you say, like, well, code it, right? Code what you see. And you see like a whole, you know, the page is like yeah. so saturated, but there's only like you know one line for that one answer, and but they're they're filling it off to the side. And so, you know, I would say, why why did you do that? Well, it was documented. Right. Um, so you know, the 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 initial training uh for coders is you know, if it's documented, code it, right? But that's not <laughs> necessarily, that's not necessarily correct in the way when you apply the specific guideline, you know, you don't code everything, but I think the key, um, you know, I got, I'm guilty, right? You, you mentioned like a lot of people don't utilize their guidelines. I mean, I just opened this book today. It's fresh out of the plastic. <laughs> um, you know, I, I typically, you know, um, refer to the electronic version one in the right. in the thing. But because I'm working with one screen, I, I have to have a book. So I got to crack this one open. But anyways, um, the key term in the symptoms, I guess, subsection is, mm -hmm. you know, code the symptom or don't code it if you have a definitive diagnosis, right? And so the key factor is when you're, I think when you're learning medical coding, it's not mm -hmm. just the medical coding, the prerequisites uh, to medical coding, anatomy, physiology, right? And I tell oh, wow, just yeah. young professionals, look, if you're really, if you really want to be successful in coding, it's really not just the coding, it's the anatomy, the pathophysiology, et cetera. It is that the pathophysiology. Right, right. Yes. that encompasses that code, right? So if you mm -hmm. if you take that education really seriously and move it into the coding realm, well, you won't have these issues with coding. You would automatically know that fever, shortness of breath, cough is inherent, is part of the definitive diagnosis, which is yeah. bronchitis or even pneumonia. You could even, you know, you could switch it any which way you want, as long as you know what those symptoms are part of. And so if and you know how to utilize those symptoms and know what the disease is that associated, you can do a lot with it. I think this is just, this is just one way of kind of strengthening yourself and just not limiting yourself. Well, I'm just going to code it. Mm -hmm. 
it, it it's empowering you. And mm -hmm. you know, that's one thing that I do get excited when the new codes come out. Mm -hmm. Now with you know 1176 new or, or revisions or you know changes to ICD-10 this year, it wasn't as fun as it is in other years where maybe we don't have as many codes, but mm -hmm. I like to take the new codes that I don't know. Hemolytic uric syndrome. What right. is that? I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. So what I will normally do is I'll research it. I'll Google it. I'll pull up, you know, WebMD and mm -hmm. find out what it is. And then more important, what are the usual signs and symptoms? Maybe Correct. put them on a posty note and mm -hmm. slap them in my book that year. Mm -hmm. Because, or, you know, I, I have, I don't know about you, but across my monitors, I have all these posty notes um, of things that, that I have to constantly look at until it becomes part of my memory. Yep. And if, if I'm in urology or if I am in, you know, um, nephrology and it's important for me to understand that, then I'm going to keep my posty note there or posty note in the book to learn, mm -hmm. oh, these are the usual signs and symptoms of a condition. So sometimes it's, we have to remember that medical coding, we need to continuously learn that pathophysiology, these conditions, how they morph, what is usual, what is not usual. Mm -hmm. So with bronchitis, if I came in with bronchitis and leg pain, knee pain, well, knee pain is because I'm a lady of a particular age, it has nothing to do with the bronchitis. And so for that visit, we are going to code my knee pain mm -hmm. um, in addition to bronchitis. So it's just, mm -hmm. and that is detailed in the guidelines. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about knee pain. Well, what's the, that drives what is going to be the definitive diagnosis? You think more clinically when you think about it that way, if there's no mm -hmm. specific diagnosis, you know, from a CDI perspective, because I've done it for 12 years and now I'm doing clinical validation auditing, you got to look <laughs> at it. How do you move forward from this diagnosis? You just, what was the condition again? Hemolytic, whatever, uric. Yeah, hemolytic what uric syndrome. Hemolytic uric syndrome. So like if I saw something new like that, I, I've never ever heard of that condition. Um, from my perspective, it's like, okay, well, what is the code, right? That's that's first mm -hmm. thing. And then you mentioned the symptomology. Right. And then the, the third thing is, what does it look like in the medical record? How does it present right. itself? Because, you know, when you're a coder, yes, you could look at it from just being documented. But when you kind of if you want to expand it more in terms of CDI and clinical validation, mm -hmm. you have to have what is it? You paint the medical picture. Right. So now, right. So, uh, you know, you have to get that bigger picture and, yeah. it's not, and it, you can't just limit yourself to documentation, but that specific condition, you're looking at the symptomology, those are codes, right? Where is the document in the medical record? What specific lab tests are associated right. with that to confirm it? What is the treatment? We're looking at, you know, the UHDDS guidelines to reporting a diagnosis. I don't know if that's part of the guideline here because I am not even looking. But, you know, that's that's something that would encompass that. When you see new codes. That's a great resource. Yeah. I want to mm -hmm. make sure that we we share that resource. The USDDS is, uh, is a place where you can go and find those conditions. Find yes. those. The, how did we get there? Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's the requirements to report a secondary diagnosis without mm -hmm. it. You know, it, it really is something that you want to look for because without it, it's not going to truly support that diagnosis to be reported. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, so, so very important. Um, another area that I wanted to go over is something that is pretty new to us. Sure. So if we look at the guidelines, uh, section I, Subsection B, section okay. 14. 14. 14 was new okay. a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I got super excited because anything that allows coders to assume, because I've it's been, been drilled in my head. I am a coder. I cannot assume. I cannot interpret. I cannot. There's so many limitations because I'm just a coder. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So when I got a little bit of power here, documentation yes. by clinicians other mm -hmm. than the patient's provider, mm -hmm. ooh, I can look within the medical record and solve maybe a problem of laterality mm -hmm. or a problem of what is the BMI that supports the morbid obesity. Or right. um, And they gave us a whole list there. And they went on to tell us what type of provider, 
what documentation, where within the medical record. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I kind of felt strong. I kind of felt like I had a little Wonder Woman moment when yeah, I. Yeah, like I, I remember. That. I don't know when this one came out, but like I remember a time, and I, I go back to my CDI days, is where mm -hmm. um, I felt pigeonholed because of the idea that you know they thought people with my background medical coding couldn't do anything in terms of you know utilizing the medical record to look at a clinical diagnosis mm -hmm. right and so when i hear you know when i when i did the social media thing and and you hear oh follow the guidelines oh if it's documented you have to code it no matter what and so when this came out i felt like boy you know it it was going to you don't want to limit the the coder, right? Because again, right. when we look at, you know, I'm going back to the conversation about pathophysiology. I mean, you yeah. took the courses, mm -hmm. you took the medical record courses, you're looking into the medical coding courses, but then you're just limited to just what is documented. I mean, that, that's, that's not, it doesn't encompass the true education. You want to make right. sure that it's in there. And with this guideline, it allows you, right, the, the not the full reign, but some, um, I guess, range of motion, right? That, yes. is, that is right. when you think about the hips, right? It's funny right. because I, because I, I, you know, this year, <laughs> you know, they say, you know, you got to look at your hip mobility and things like that on social media. And I'm doing these weird exercises at home because I'm like, man, I can't touch my toes. When's the last time I touched my toes? And, you know, it's good to increase your range of motion, right? And so when you're looking at it from this perspective, it allows that. And so Are you you're doing not a TikTok limited on it. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do my hip mobility exercises on TikTok. No, thank you. That's that's something that is just for me. <laughs> I do follow you on TikTok, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Um, but you know, it it allows that. It allows for that. Yeah. To say, hey, you know, and, and it 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 allows you because you're educated for that specific diagnosis. You know, you can go to that specific part of the medical record. You know that you can look here. Especially when you look into auditing, you just don't want to be limited to just that progress note, just right. that HNP, just that discharge right. summary or whatever. Now you know exactly where to go and the power of navigating through the medical record and that this guideline right here definitely helps you out. I like the part that they talk about social determinants of health mm -hmm. because I feel like that's kind of new for all of us. That's it's the new just, symptom codes, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, those are the oh new archives. You're so <laughs> right because, and and they had to go back this year and add like an additional um, guideline in the chapter specific section that. Let says, me guess, like hold hold your horses, guys. Yes, hold they did. Horse. That's exactly what they said. They were like, okay, so I figured that would happen. <laughs> right, not everybody that lives alone has a problem living alone. Maybe mm -hmm. they like living alone and they yeah. feel great, and so mm -hmm. that's not. A reportable diagnosis is not a problem. No, right. But... It's not exactly. It's not a problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It became our new signs and symptoms there. <laughs> that's so, funny. yeah. Another thing that I see a lot that maybe we can get some guidance in the guidelines is um, sequencing diagnosis. Mm. I get that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I teach also, um, and I'm, that's probably one of the biggest things my students will say to me is like, what comes first? Like, right. Well, it's in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Oh, can't you just tell me what comes first? But right. we should know where, where, you know, if something happens, where can we go and find that information again of what comes first, especially when we're talking about etiology and manifestations. Mm -hmm. Manifestations, and, code first, right? Code also. Yep. Yeah. Right here. Exactly. Uh, what, are the, what are the things that my, um, you know, I have a team and most of my team, well, half of my team, I guess, you know, it comprises of both coders and nurses, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, as as a, as a manager, I try to lean on their weaknesses. So for the coders, it's the clinical side. Say, I'm not clinical. I'm like, okay, well, let's make it clinical, right? Let's right. pair you up with somebody who's, you know, uh, clinical and let's That's just make it happen. That's a wonderful idea. Right. So. The for the for the for the nurses, oh, I'm not I don't have a coding background. That ain't that's no problem, right? And so there's some people who, for example, um, I have one that got her CIC, right? And I had another oh. one who says, Well, I'm an, I'm thinking about the CCS. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, if you say that, then you you know I'm going to make it work for you. I'm going to push you on these coding things. 
And so sometimes right. they ask questions, you know, from a clinical standpoint. And then I ask the coding question. Did you look it up in the code? Did you see the sequencing guidelines? Did you look yeah. at the coding instructions to see what needs to be coded first, what needs to be coded second, right? And they're like, I didn't even think about that. I said, maybe you should because you want to do coding, right? You want to do, you want to get your CIC, you want to get your CCS. Well, let's get started. And I always ask these questions, but I never give the answer. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> right. I That's said, just awesome. you need to look for it. Yes. You need to know how it sequence it. Come back to me and see if it's right. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. and I I have a tendency to share that if if there's certain codes that are due to, mm -hmm. well, wouldn't the normal question be due to what? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So think about sometimes logically how you would ask those questions. Code mm -hmm. first. Well, wouldn't there be something second then? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Code also. Well, who's who is what? What is it coming with, right? right. You know, what, where's where's the date? You know, I'm co I'm coming also with. Okay, where, right. where's that person? Who's your right? plus one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <sighs> exactly. We deal with these things all the time, but sometimes, you know, I think as uh, and, and I deal with a lot of new students and a lot yeah. of new coders, and Normal. and they'll get very nervous and. And then they hate the answer. Go back to the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Everything you need to know is is there in front of you, mm -hmm. and you have right. You gotta yeah, like, follow oh. the <laughs> right. Sleep on it. All right. <laughs> Bring it with you. Right. When you, it's the same thing. Like you, you blaze through a stop sign and you get pulled over. And mm -hmm. if you looked at that officer and said, "I didn't know what that big red sign meant," <laughs> he's gonna go. You had to take a test. It had an it S on, on it, I think. Test. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was red. I don't know. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know, right? So sometimes we have to know, and and we have to know, and the information is in front of us. There's no secret. The the guidelines are not proprietary. It's not like the other agency that keeps all of their coding guidance under lock and key. Mm -hmm. Wink, wink. You know who mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Um, the guidelines are available online. They're in every one of our ICD-10 books. They're, they're not hard to find at all mm -hmm. and they're available for us. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, you know, the coder needs to be, uh, at least for new coders, they need to know to go to it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we say go to the guidelines. It's, it's something that I don't like to hear, but for uh, one of the requirements as a medical coding you know, professional is to wire your brain to these guidelines. And when you apply specifically efficiency, productivity, KPIs, that's yeah. important because if, you know, I find, you know, for example, I have people on a team and sometimes they just chat with one another. Well, is that concrete evidence? Did you go to the guidelines? No, I just heard it from, from so-and-so. Well, you know, <laughs> there goes your quality audit because you can't source Absolutely. your next coworker. Right. And so, yeah. you know, when you think about productivity, cause you know, the, the one thing that I always see is like, you know, I get into a job, but then I lost the job. Well, because of productivity, nobody talks to you about productivity. And the 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 hard um, the hard advice is look at your guidelines. But the 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 deeper meaning behind that is wire your brain for efficiency. Yeah. Because if you see it again, you need to know exactly where it is and how to reference it. Because the more the faster you get to it, the repetition, the consistency. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, then your KPI goes up. When you think about medical coding from a production standpoint, those are bonuses. Mm -hmm. Those are your annual Absolutely. performances. You know, you got to think about it that way. And, you know, that's why I say all the time, these guidelines, we read them not just once, not mm -hmm. just twice, mm -hmm. but three times. Yes. And not to memorize mm -hmm. them, but no. after that third time, you have seen it enough to leave, I call them breadcrumbs in your mind. So when I say something like, hmm, do I code signs and symptoms? Your mind should immediately go, there's a guideline for that. Yes. And that is general information, not chapter specific. Mm -hmm. So now I know I'm going to IB. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to look through the different sections in IB, but you're a lot closer to the answer than I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And so... You know, the guidelines is just the smallest piece of medical coding because, you know, again, 
efficiency. I mean, I'm because I, I manage that, you know, mm -hmm. referring to the guidelines, knowing where it is in the medical record, looking at a condition and just knowing through your own knowledge that you're supposed to have coming into a role, you know, such as auditing, medical coding. Mm -hmm. What are the what what are your as a, what I call your anticipation points? When you yes. see something like CHF, what are you going to anticipate specifically for a sp this patient? And you can run through your R codes, you can run through your symptomology codes, right? Yep. But the bigger picture, the paint the medical picture is your CHF, right? And that's the key. But then right. you look at it from a clinical perspective, the documentation perspective, and I'm put my hand here, the, the guideline perspective. That is the key. <laughs> And it's helpful, you know, I, I know that, you know, we're moving into a value-based reimbursement um, mm -hmm. in the future. The numbers are there. We've every year we're, we're really going more towards that and treating and, and having reimbursement that is based on those illnesses, those conditions that we know historically are going to get worse or they're going to require a lot of money to get the patient stable mm -hmm. or maybe a cure, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those mm -hmm. codes we can cure. And in order to represent those codes effectively, and that's mm -hmm. a great, I think I like that word, effectively, um, we need to make sure we're coding everything to the highest level of specificity, that we're yes. utilizing the guidelines, that <laughs> we are reporting those manifestations, that we, all of those things that Again, the, the guidelines are not a cure-all, like you said, but they do lay out a great foundation for Correct. success. Correct. Yeah. You're right. Right. Absolutely. So very excited. Anything else that you think in this particular section um, that someone who maybe didn't read it would definitely benefit from? I think um, we were just talking about external codes, right? The external yes. codes, just making sure that you're coding everything revolving around, you know, the con the, the situation of the condition happening, um, especially for like example, inpatient coding, inpatient mm -hmm. coding. I mean, gosh, they they have a a really hard job because they have to code everything. And right. you know, when I did cross training as an inpatient coder for like maybe a year, you know, you you don't necessarily think about coding the external cause codes, the adverse effect codes, things that paint that specific, what exactly happened with this right. diagnosis, especially because I used to work at a level one trauma center and then those were, <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta explain everything in those codes. And my sister, she works as a uh, trauma registrar and she has to utilize wow. those external codes. Yes. And those fracture yes. codes, those trauma codes. So those are Definitely important. I know they, they have to use these specific guidelines to assign them as well. I also say clinically that the external causes are really important to give that path of care. Mm -hmm. So if you you know run into an urgent care center, the wound really does depend on how it happened. So mm -hmm. if I was riding my skateboard and wiped out, which would mm -hmm. never happen, by the way, because mm -hmm. um, I'm an excellent skateboarder. <laughs> but <laughs> I like to see it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> so I have, I have a couple it. longboards if you want them. Let's okay. go. <laughs> so if, but if I did wipe out like gravel, dirt, grass, mm -hmm. maybe, right, that's going to need debridement. We need to make sure that wound is really clean before we close it up. And that might take time. It might take resource. Um, mm. But if I'm in the kitchen cutting a carrot, which by the way, would never happen because they don't let me in the room with the hot box. Oh. Okay? <laughs> that is not my room. Um, but that might be a, a cleaner environment. It's a carrot. It mm. wasn't something that they really need to worry about infection. So I even tell coders that if you really want to take it down to the, 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 the silly why, um, because it directs patient care, it mm. directs the, um, the amount of time that might be required due to the circumstances, or even better to your point from a registrar's perspective, mm -hmm. which is another area of healthcare yes. that a lot of coders mm -hmm. do go into. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. that information is, is just critical. You know, one thing that I'm, um, cause my wife is an ER and she actually went, went to work last night. And um, you know, the, when she brings, you know, when the patients come in, they have to tell their story. Right? right. And so when you think about documentation from the triage standpoint, and then also, 
you know, you have these scribes now that come in with mm -hmm. a position in the ER and they're documenting, oh, hey, what, you know, they come in, hey, sir, how are you doing? Oh, I'm in such in pain. Well, like, tell me exactly what happened. Well, I was skateboarding, you know, in, in the beach and then some dog just went across my way. I tripped over the dog. I landed on the, you know, the boardwalk and I went into the sand and then a shark bit me on the leg. You know, that's... <laughs> That type oh, that of thing. A bad day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So skateboard accident slash shark bite, right? <laughs> I want to see that coded. That would be fun. I, I had a friend of mine who coded the night before Christmas oh. in external cause codes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh boy. Well, Brian, I can't believe our time is up today. Oh gosh, that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking with me and my friends and other coders and the new ones and the older ones and yeah. You know, just uh, being a part of this community, you are such a presence. You share so much information. You're free CEUs, yeah. Um, the medical coding geek, mm -hmm. um, your TikTok, your reels like, you really do provide <laughs> so much for our industry, and we appreciate you so much. Oh, thank, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It is my pleasure, definitely. We will talk again, my friends, for sure. All right, thanks for watching here. Have a wonderful day.